record, so I have this, and then we're going to go. Cool. So, what we um, what we want to do is we want to talk through. <laughs> brilliant. Um, we want to talk through um, first and foremost the concept of energy balance, and I mean this is a time where it provides us a lot of challenge. It provides us um, some, and I've seen both, and particularly working across the continuum with clients at the moment, um, we're seeing it from a point of view of some people are struggling to eat enough, and then there's obviously there's the obvious one in terms of just border meeting and um, kind of just general management of behaviors and, and things like that. As well as that, hey Sonia, um, as well as that, there is um, consideration or worry, if you like, around just, quote, loss of gains in the sense of because we're not necessarily um, having exposure to as much resistance and, and that kind of stuff and weight training, people, the, one of the common themes that we've seen over the past couple of days is this kind of like loss of muscle mass and, and all the rest of it. And so we just want to talk through that as well. So the first kind of thing that we want to, um, we want to touch upon is as I said, just this notion of energy balance and first and foremost, our body composition and to some extent our health is going to be um, governed by this, this notion of, of kind of calories in versus calories out. Um, from a point of view of health is a, as, a, as a kind of a more holistic thing isn't necessarily as simple as that but in terms of the the amount of body fat that we have is governed by that this kind of law of thermodynamics and so what we have is i'm just gonna i am gonna share my screen um so what we have is um this idea that, and if you've heard me heard me before, we have this um, concept of calorie deficit, energy being man managed, um, energy being managed by um, this three thousand five hundred calories equals one pound of body fat, and so within this, um, I've lost myself because there we go, that's better. Um, within this. What this means is, so say if you have a total daily energy expenditure of 3,000 calories, you can literally calculate your rate of fat loss and fat gain. Now, I'll, what I've, I'll fundamentally say is one pound of fat loss, of, of fat, sorry, is about the size of my fist, something like that, okay, size of my fist. Um, that's one pound of fat. Now, the idea of that and what that looks like on the scales is going to be completely different. It's completely different. There's so many variables that impact scales. Um, I'm very fortunate enough to work with um, like weight in weightlifting, British weightlifting, and, and kind of do the nutrition for that. And obviously that's a weight making sport. And there are so many variables that impact scale weight, um, everything from stress levels, like even in terms of if you've had a hard training day, there's this concept of cell, cellular inflammation because um, you will naturally hold on to more, um, more water. So after a hard training day, we would expect you to weigh heavier. Um, your carbohydrate intake, your fiber intake, um, to some extent your fat intake all of these variables your hydration status all of these variables basically impact scale weight so we want to separate this notion of body fat in, in its actual sense versus um, scale weight and, and all that kind of stuff and maybe later down the line we'll, we'll do some form of um, we'll talk through the variables of, of scale weight and how we can kind of interpret that effectively. So if we kind of lose that attachment to the scales and, and kind of have this idea of, of body composition management, we can literally kind of, if we look at it very objectively, we can manage our body composition from a kind of a pure mathematics game. And once you kind of um, start to understand it, you can kind of predict scale weight fluctuations that kind of come with that. And so this is an example here that 
you have someone's total daily energy expenditure of 3000 calories. And then um, if they, for seven days, they have 2500 calories, they basically create an energy deficit of 500 calories. And then as a result, 500 times that by seven, and it be equals 3500. And it just becomes this process of, of, banking calories now obviously we're not all in the game of fat loss and so this is that's a calculation for one pound of fat loss within a week um, but what it does do is start to bring around kind of consideration of um of kind of first and foremost particularly if we are in this um this environment this food environment we're stuck in our own flats um and homes which isn't exactly optimal and food focus is arguably a bit higher then we can start to just separate this notion of kind of good and bad food and understand that fundamentally a calorie is a calorie now there is some cons further consideration around that which i will go through um I'll go through shortly, um, but that's the first message in the sense of we just need to fundamentally manage our energy balance to go th uh, to go get through this time, and we can come out, we can mitigate um, and come out of the other side of this kind of coronavirus relatively unscathed, um, and that's the kind of uh, the first thing point to point to kind of note that also has some translation in terms of performance as well now what we're talking about here we're talking about the particularly the in the context of those that are worried about maybe putting on a bit of body fat we're worried about kind of um like say maybe not having access to their normal foods and and that kind of thing and in this situation it's just a kind of a case of just reminder just make it fundamentally fit make it fit within your kind of quote bank balance make it fit within your calories um, and you will be okay regardless of where that those calories come from and i say that with a bit with a pinch of salt because we if we have some consideration over that um, and i'll talk through the kind of more performance side of that in a minute but if we have some consideration over that then it's going to um, serve us really really well um, now in terms of kind of a rough calculation of energy balance I've kind of put that here now you can be a bit more specific in the sense of using things like the Harris and Benedict equation um, which you can google I'm not going to run you through it's a bit more complex but this is something that is really really a quick way to do it um, so you can literally get your calculator out and you can multiply your body weight in kilos by 22 if you're a female or 24 if you are a male. Now, that will give you an approximation of your BMR. That's your basal metabolic rate. So if I was to say, if I was to say, just lie there, you are on, only allowed to blink and breathe that is how many calories you would expend. That is not including any form of activity whatsoever, not even the kind of like the hand gestures, not even any steps, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the fundamental um, amount to basically to keep you alive. Then what you then have is you can then multiply this by your physical activity level. Now, this can extend from 1.1 to about 2.5. I've only ever, well, it can go higher actually, but I've only ever used 1.1 with someone with no lower limb function. And that's been once. And so they had no lower limb function and thus I use 1.1. So even in these times where we are more sedentary, it's going to be a minimum of 1.2. Um, now, obviously, in terms of confinement and, and all the rest of it, there will be some consideration around it may be slightly dropping but we can take measures to boost it just putting in things like step um, trying to make a conscious effort to hit step goals um, and then I I would probably say that no one's going to be above 1.5 1.4 um, at this time if particularly if we're living and if we are kind of social distancing and we are kind of um, keeping ourselves in our apartments and so situating it in around 1.3 is not going to be a bad thing or 1.375 is what I've put there. Um, 
and just and a reminder that maintenance first and foremost is uh, is a range and so there are some days where you will expend more and some days where you will expend less and um, it's important to kind of just take note of that because if we go into something like this with the expectation of I am going to be so rigid with my nutrition I'm going to aim for this calorie goal and this well and this is the kind of the thing that particularly at this we have to acknowledge that we are emotive beings we are social beings we're emotionally driven um and that kind of thing um and so it isn't as simple as as having the expectation of we are going to eat the same um calories every single day because that might arguably be a bit unrealistic but it's the same in the sense of expenditure we're not going to expend the same every day so i would look at making a lower limit and an upper limit and then as a result um kind of force it forming a range between there and then you can adjust according to your goal um what i know I'll, I'll, I'll say at this at this point now what this does provide for those um it this kind of situation does provide um a greater opportunity within reason within reason for, for for a more quote fat loss approach and i'm i'll be quite specific in the uh, in the way that it kind of go about this kind of engaging in in crossfit in strength use of um use of barbells dumbbells they are quite neurally demanding they have a, quite a high impact on something called your central nervous system. Now, your central nervous system is, is something that kind of governs a lot of processes within the body, but one of them is appetite regulation. And so we've seen it before. You might have done some form of workout um, at P10, and it can be quite high impact, and thus you've just felt like eating the world all day. Now, what this, the, imp, the way exercise impacts you will be quite specific to you. For example, um, those that kind of know me will know that I, um, my, appetite, my appetite is significantly impacted by things like high intensity weights training so if i was to do a classical weights um training with say a session which involved heavy power cleans some back squatting some deadlifting, a kind of a more barbell focused session my body doesn't it responds well in terms of training stimulus cool i'm going to get stronger but it, it, i find that really taxing and whereas i can do kind of um hours of burpees something more low impact but much more higher energy expenditure and it's it doesn't affect me at all whereas some people are the other way around they high amounts of cardio high amounts of energy expenditure that impacts their um, appetite and so it's important to kind of make a uh, make a note of that however because where are the the exercise that we are engaging in is going to be something that is less impacting it's going to be less neurally stimulating and then as a result is going to um, impact our central nervous system um, in a decreased amount then our appetite regulation is going to be far more efficient i mean and you see things like um you see kind of say jane who's 55 years old and slightly overweight and she goes to weight watchers and she's just able to be really really aggressive and lose um pound after pound after pound of body fat um with no kind of massive consideration she should be really aggressive in a calorie deficit that's because she leaves a, leads quite a low impact um lifestyle whereas we have to acknowledge that as fantastic as weightlifting uh, crossfit is it m does make it kind of slightly more difficult to be more aggressive in terms of a fat loss approach so maybe if your goal is fat loss then there is some consideration around doing it at this time um if only if that is your goal of course but um there is i will say that there is some consideration about fundamentally managing behaviors and relationship with food in that sense um 
I'm just trying to see if there's any questions as well. Cool. What I will say as well is when you are kind of management of calorie intake, we go back to this idea because this is something that is probably, as I said, very unrealistic. We are in a position where we are looking to fundamentally manage our averages. We're looking to manage... Um, we are a sum of our averages. We're managing our calorie intake uh, on the whole. And I always use the guy, I always use an example of um, a, one client that I work with who was very kind of, um, quote, he was a, he owned a construction company. He was very jack, the lad, lad, lads, loved basically binge drinking on a weekend. And it's something that I couldn't really get him out of. So he, his structure never changed and so he would have 4000 calories on a saturday which used which involved copious amounts of pints of beer and despite having 4000 calories what we would do is just manage the other 6 days because if you have 6 days at 2000 calories and then one day at 4000 calories your average is still only 2285 calories and so having this kind of consideration and of what your weekly average is then that's something that is we can just kind of particularly at a time like this we can just kind of look to play what's in front of us we can say well how was my eating yesterday and do i need to account for it and then you can even do that on and like i say you can even do that on a, a kind of a month to month basis um there are and obviously say if we are potentially in in kind of um a more isolation and um, social distancing for say the next four weeks we can just evaluate it week to week and say well how was my week last week and if it if it is something where the average maybe got away from you you still have the ability to um you still have the ability to manage the average for the month and i i personally even think that looking at um looking at it week to week in that in that sense is or managing the average for the week is a too small a time frame to think about it and i would look at well how's my average been over the month slash two months obviously the most obvious example is you can give is this idea of managing calorie intake over in in according to your menstrual cycle now the as i look at the guys when i talk about that but the the obviously it's well known that females can be an absolute nightmare at that time and the and i have huge amounts of empathy i have huge amounts of empathy i feel as if i've vicariously lived lived it through many different females and there's huge cravings with some females a huge um kind of and it can massively there's huge emotion um and there's it can massively deter deter someone from their kind of goals but if i use one female who i still work with her nutrition structure has never changed the week before her her period she has 2300 calories calorie surplus because she is fundamentally an emotional nightmare and she doesn't really have anything any care that i she doesn't care of anything that I have to say, but we've just accounted for that. And so she'll go 2,300. The next week she goes about 1,700. The next week after that, she's a lot more aggressive and she's 1,300. And then she goes back up to about 15 something. And that average has then just meant she just rolls through it. Fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, fat loss. Um, and again, this is in the context of fat loss. However, you just adjust the calories according to your goal. You adjust the calories according to um, the, the rate of body composition management in that sense. So if we want to have some degree of maintenance, um, we accept that within reason overeating or an overconsumption of calories is part of life and we accept that it's inevitable and it's in isolated incidents it's not something to overthink however if it's a case of um if it's a case of one minute jay i'll come to you in a minute um if it's a case of um kind of i've lost my show i thought jay you're gonna yes go for it jay i've unmuted you 
I'm trying to. Um, yeah, so sorry for disrupting you so much. So you're talking about like uh, maintenance in caloric intake and stuff. Um, yep. At the beginning, you touched on um, resistances as well. And like, obviously, in this training time, a lot of us, including myself, who've been used to regular strength training, don't have the same sort of stimulus as we would use as we as we would be used to. Um, in my previous military service, I was very used to going on long periods of uh, time away without getting that high level of resistance or strength training in and then coming back. But during that time away, what I'd do is I'd overeat, end up heavy. So I'd come back and lift the same weights as when I left. Um, yep. And then I'd go through a period of kind of like leaning out. Would you say like that, that was, that was through, that was through no, like I've zero knowledge, but that was just kind of how it worked. And there was also a lot of peanut butter on board a ship. So that was easy. Um, but like, I just, I'm wondering if what your viewpoint is on that and, 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 and whether for those of us who've built up this, this strength over a long period of time, um, or, uh, how would you, what would your approach to that be? Um, well, that is some, it's, it's definitely a, it's definitely a method. So in the sense of like, we acknowledge that mass moves mass and, um, a maintenance of sh a strength, um, can come from, a, just being heavier, first and foremost, but pound for pound, you're weak, weaker. Um, however, as well as that, um, what you are support, and I'll, I will go in, this is actually something I will cover, so I'm just going to briefly kind of go over this. Um, because one of the, the kind of the key components of a maintenance of your performance is going to be your consistency of energy availability, the consistency of your calorie intake as a whole. And so if you're supporting that with a, what is a calorie surplus, then that can, it, that can be um, something that serves you. Um, depend and i'll talk through there is some macronutrient considerations is it completely necessary no um because you can mitigate these things um through kind of macronutrient ratios and um kind of managing food intake as a, as a whole but f for those that are kind of listening and those that are kind of um will listen listen retrospectively that's definitely a kind of consideration um that you might want to have um you might want to have in terms of okay i am going to use this as a, as a small controlled um bulk i hate that word um and then within reason you can then periodize your nutrition after it to then offset that and use it to your advantage in the same way that it sounds like um jj did back in the mil in his military days it'd say it's not essential but it could be it could be a way um it could be a way of um basically managing behaviors if that makes sense because if we are just accepting of like okay well i and i'll talk i will we'll talk through the specifics of how you could manage this and considerations in a moment but if we're just accepting that okay i'm going to go through a small calorie surplus um and you utilize that to your advantage it might lead to much more consistency over this period of time in your behaviors which will serve you far more better than kind of having this kind of undulating um, calorie intake as a whole particularly in the management of performance does that kind of make sense yeah it helps thank you very much cool if anyone does have any questions then please um raise just raise your hand um I, it comes up as a, a note on my screen that it can raise your hands danny i'm gonna meet you now go yeah. for it um yeah so regarding the recommended ten thousand steps a day Obviously, now it's not going to be possible, especially if there's well, going to be a lockdown. We don't know. Yes. How, how in terms of like weight loss or like not gaining weight, will that impact? Because, I mean, I'm sitting all day or like standing, but I'm in my room, in the kitchen, as everyone, I guess. Like, yeah, of course. We're not getting that many steps. So the reason why 10,000 steps is the recommendation, because for an average size human, both male and female, um, well, I say average size human in terms of body weight, um, that equates to about 80 kilos. Um, so 10,000 steps is equal to 500 calories, approximately worth of calorie expenditure. Um, and so what you can, what you can do, and that, and obviously if we go to here, 500 
calories with deficit is equal times by seven, 10,000 is one pound of body fat a week. Um, so just, I would just say, okay, obviously in, in the context of you, Danny, you're not 80 kilos, but you can kind of offset that in the sense. But then at the same time, I'd be like, don't, write, not- don't write yourself off. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've been pacing around my flat. I've been taking, like, obviously I've been working and stuff today and, and all the rest of it, taking calls, like, and just not stopping moving. And so in yeah. terms of, like, one of the most positive behaviours that we can kind of get into, um, and this is outside of, outside of um, kind of quarantined life, is a, a, a higher activity levels. It is um your what's called your neat your non-exercise activity thermogenesis and which is fundamentally just your step count and there is other things like fidgeting with your hands that's neat as well yeah. um, but um trying to promote that and i wouldn't i would argue to not just be accepting of a 2000 step count of the day and just make a point like, and reality is like what else is there to do um yeah. so yeah you can adjust your calorie intake accordingly so say if for an 80 kilo individual um it's a, a, around 500 calories but then for uh, maybe slightly lighter it's going to be 350 and all the rest of it and then just kind of run it by that um and then what i will say in terms of particularly in terms of the calculation of where you should situate your calorie intake um just like run it by me i'm here um yeah so ask ask those questions and i'll happily happily answer them mm, thank you cool sanjay i'm just gonna unmute you go for it buddy i think you should be able to hold on one minute one minute why can i not hello can you hear me go for it it. right yeah um so you know for for those of us who have desk jobs how much do you think the actual reduction in i guess energy expenditure is there because i guess like from my perspective i'm i'm stretching a lot more now i'm moving around a lot more as opposed to being sat at my desk for eight hours straight yeah but then that's obviously sort of counteracted with you know maybe slightly less volume or intensity from training and like like how, how do you sort of figure out that balance on how much to scale back without scaling back too much, if that makes sense? Because I guess, I guess no one wants to scale back too much if they don't have to. Yeah, well, <laughs> what are you saying? No one wants to reduce their calorie intake if they don't have to, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, completely. I mean, what you there is there's loads of different kind of points of metrics that you can kind of um take on board um i would look at scale weight fluctuations would be one that i would look at um and in terms of particularly there's going to be naturally undulating fluctuations but if it becomes a point of um like you see a difference of oh, i need to get this right um you see a difference i'm going to f- fact check myself in a moment but it's going to be and if you, if you see a difference of about 0.8 of a kilo or more in your average scale weight from week to week so that's a daily that's a daily scale measurement um and you take all of them you add them together and then divide them by seven and then you compare that week one with week two if there's a difference in that then i would have consideration over kind of slight reduction if it's any less than that then i would just probably say you're kind of all okay um but then that's just quite generally like i say the 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 variables that do impact that are quite um are huge and it depends on how it depends on your how consistent your macronutrient ratio is um and then as well as that there will be consideration over just like the more qualitative points of feedback like the way that your energy levels are the way that your appetite is the way that your um like i say your clothes are fitting and stuff like that it's like i there is a lot of intuition within that but um i would be in a in a sense that particularly for those with desk jobs um you are probably maybe more active particularly if you're engaging in um in stretching and all the rest of it so your energy expenditure might not be that different however there might be some consideration around kind of macronutrient if you're being that anal about it but i'll run through that in a minute is there any more questions before i move on 
Cool, 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 cool. Right, so then we want to just kind of, right, let's talk macronutrients. Let's talk, um, so macronutrients is basically a, um, it is, an umbrella term for carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, which is basically what it means. And we're going to kind of touch upon, I mean, this is applies in and out the gym, but then this is, um, this is something that we can look at to our advantage because there are principles here that might, that may well serve us during this time or considerations that may serve us during this time. And as I've said, um, kind of alluded to, consistent energy availability is one of the number one factors. Um, and that is consistency in calorie intake. And so building a range of calories that, I, so, so it's not a case of, okay, today I have 800 calories and then the next day I have 3,600 calories or what, um, like say, seeing some, clients who have two a normal amount of calories and then just basically binge and what that brings is fundamentally if you manage your averages it's not going to be that detrimental like if i go back to the bill the guy that i used to work with in terms of he used to binge drink every week weekend he still had um he still effectively lost body fat he still effectively kind of work towards his goal however that is then so i put it, it will if if we under eat or if we overeat there will be small fluctuations in your hormones which will we we know it like you've you've been out you've either overeaten and the next day you feel quite lethargic or um you've when we undereat, particularly when we undereat consistently, there'll be start to be a down regulation in, in certain hormones, which is the body's natural response, which again will kind of um, start to basically lead to lethargy, maybe decrease in, in mood, decrease in performance and all the rest of it. And so if we can, particularly for those, if we're looking at the maintenance of performance and we take kind of, um, fat loss out of the equation here trying to maintain a consistent energy availability is going to serve us as as best as uh, possible and this kind of goes back to when we get back in the gym in um in terms of the number one factor people kind of get hung up on what some of the other things that maybe i'll talk through but if there's a mismanagement of calories and we're not serving ourselves and we're not placing our calories in the right place then it can be like I say you're, you're missing the most important factor um so just bear that in mind and the the kind of the main thing is that is that it can lead to um like I say, maybe not the most optimal of, of, of decisions in that sense. So, I mean, variety, when this is something I'll touch upon in a moment, but variety promotes, um, promotes appetite and obviously the exposure to certain foods psychologically can trigger cravings and, and all these kind of stuff that might, might not serve us in that sense. Um, the main things, and this is, this is where, so like that, we've very much been about kind of a calorie as a calorie at that at, at this stage whereas um this is where it kind of starts to get a bit different one of the biggest things that you can do to mitigate quote loss of gains is have some consideration around your protein intake um now what happens is the process of retention or development of muscle mass, depending on the so retention and development, um, it depends on what stimulus you kind of give the body, um, is comes from a, stimu a stimulation of something called muscle protein sim synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis. Um, and what that is, is a process that um, is stimulated by your training. Training is the best um, kind of mechanism to stimulate this process. Um, versus, but you also do this through the consumption of protein. And so because we've lost huge amounts of resistance training, there, is a con there becomes a greater consideration around management of your protein intake. 
Um, now, what this looks like then is having a greater consideration of first and foremost, your total protein intake, your net protein intake for the, for the day. Um, as well as that, protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So there is a hormone that from called leptin that sends a signal from the stomach to the brain tells you you're full. This is best triggered by protein. Um, and so in terms of management of appetite, having consistency of protein feedings um, can help manage our energy levels. It can help manage, um, it can help um, just kind of manage that idea of just um, appetite on the whole. Um, as well as that, like I say, I mean, if we're being really um, kind of specific in terms of how it can also influence um, energy expenditure, which may or may not lead to fat loss, it depends on how you situate the rest of your calories. There's something called the thermic effect of feeding, which is basically when we consume calories, we require calories to burn calories. So the process of digesting calories um, requires energy right so if i wanted to kind of um break this table it's going to require energy to for me to break it and it's the same kind of thing so it's the sense of if i have a hundred calories of, of carbohydrate that um that i consume i will only absorb about 90 percent of them and i'll utilize 10 percent of them in the process of breaking it down fat is even less it can be anywhere between you can absorb anywhere from 97 percent to 100 percent of the calories it's a much more efficient process. Um, and then as well as that um, protein, then you only will absorb 70% of the calories and then you will um, utilize 30% of them in the process of metabolizing and breaking it down. And so within that, if you have two days that are exactly the same in terms of energy expenditure and then even calorie intake. So on both days, you have 2000 calories, but on one day you have 150 grams of protein, but on the other day you have 75 grams of protein. You will literally have a higher energy expenditure on that day, on the, on the day that you have the 150 grams of protein because you will, um, you will have absorbed less calories in that sense. Um, so there is some consideration around managing your energy deficit there. But the main thing that I would kind of look at is this from a point of view of mitigating muscle loss. Now, the first thing that I would say is that the rate of muscle loss probably isn't as fast as you think particularly engaging in the in in kind of home workout sessions and just generally staying active there may be some considerations because you're not necessarily getting as much exposure to resistance but that can largely come through first and foremost stimulation of muscle but also just um body stores um and a couple of other variables like that and so what we basically want to do is have some consideration around stimulating this muscle protein synthesis process as frequently as possible. Now, bear with me with this and I'm, gonna, um, I'm going to expect questions, but I'm going to try and explain this as best as possible. So the stimulation of this process comes from first and foremost training, um, but then as well as that, it also comes from consumption of protein now in order to maximally stimulate this process it requires you to hit something called your leucine threshold those that work with me will know all, all about this now basically what that is is that when we consume protein protein is broken down into amino acids there's 20 of them um, and all you need to know is that one of them is called leucine now, what I want you to think about in terms of the pro, this muscle retaining process, it's, it's like a gun, basically. Now, what you have is 20 amino acids, which are broken down from protein. So when I consume a chicken breast, it gets broken down into 20 amino acids. 19 amino acids of, the, of these um, form the bullet in the sense of this is this bullet of amino acids is going to go out and it's going to either retain your muscle mass or it's going to build your muscle mass. Um, then from there, leucine is the trigger. And so what we need to do is hit a certain amount of leucine to be able to 
fire off this process. Now, what does this look like in, in terms of everyday life? Um, is um, you have to then take, this is how we work our leucine threshold here. You take your body weight in kilos and multiply it by 0.03. So if I have a 70 kilo individual, then I require 2.1 grams of leucine for um to maximally stimulate this process then you convert that um into actual protein amount by nine multiplying that number by nine and so for the uh, 70 kilo individual all they need is 18.9 or 19 grams of protein to maximally stimulate this process and this is where the myth of um you can only absorb a certain amount of protein comes from at one time because once you reach this threshold then your body will kind of not stop utilizing the protein but then it will just basically the anything on top of that so for example a chicken breast is 45 grams of protein approximately give or take the size and so anything above that the remainder of the 45 grams will just be drip fed into the bloodstream over over time as opposed to being utilized there and then but it still gets utilized um, and so what we can basically have then and one of the things that i would suggest you doing is can you work out this your leucine threshold and what that looks like in direct, it, how that directly transfers into protein intake. And then can you stimulate that? Can you consume that as frequently as possible throughout the day? So three to five portions of protein. And so if you have this 17, 70, 70 kilo individual, can you consume night, a minimum, a minimum, you can go higher than this, a minimum of um, 19 grams of protein as frequently as possible throughout the day. And that is going to go a long way to offset any loss of gain, gain in that sense um, and we'll have huge cons um, consideration around the management of our muscle mass um, there is as I said some consideration around the net total amount now I would be inclined so normally we we can kind of situate protein in the sense of anywhere between 1.2 grams per kilo of body weight all the way up to 2.5 five grams i mean you can go even higher there's studies done that have been had four grams per kilo of body weight um and as a result um I would have some consideration around the net total amount um, because this is only going to kind of enhance that. So particularly at this time, time, I would be have some consideration around just trying to increase it on the whole. Yes, do it have the frequency there if you can, but then fundamentally, if you can have the um, if you can have the idea of um maybe working towards two grams 2.2 even to, um 2.5 grams if i'm being honest i normally aim for about 1.8 personally so i aim for about 1.8 grams per kilo of body weight and no i'm waiting for jj to put in something about happy that being 300 grams of protein um but um and then i'm increasing it to 2.5 grams i'm making a conscious effort if i do anything during this time of quarantine i'm trying to push it towards 2.5 grams just around because my training's different um and i'm not getting exposure to as much as much resistance in that sense um does anyone have if you have any questions just raise your hands very quickly otherwise i'll move on to around kind of carbohydrates Cool. Awesome. 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 So the next one is in terms of carbohydrate. Um, so the only thing is with carbohydrate, there's no right or wrong. Carbohydrates and fat have no bearing on your body composition, providing that um, calories, etc., are equated for. Now, um, the demands of the day is generally how we kind of um, calculate your carbohydrate intake but it doesn't really matter largely comes down to preference um, i personally prefer a higher carbohydrate diet i don't eat as much fat but if you are someone that likes your 
bacon and your avocado and you can you've done well you've got hold of that during these kind of times then um then yeah it's something that it doesn't really matter and so there is that kind of thing now the thing is with carbohydrate is that so one gram of carbohydrate is equal to four calories whereas one gram of fat is equal to nine calories we know fat is is more calorie dense you will get more bang for your buck you will be able you will get more food volume by increasing your carbohydrate and when we look at the stimulation of of satiety we do very much it can as well be a, a psychological thing we do eat with our eyes and and all this kind of thing um, so there is some considerations there now i put a big word on the screen there called de novo lipogenesis which is a really really straightforward um kind of process well it's not a straightforward process but it's a straightforward principle um and this basically means when you have a surplus of calories when you have a surplus of calories you um have the run the risk run the risk of basically turning that directly into body fat um and um if this surplus of calories comes from carbohydrate then um it is a really really difficult process to happen it's an expensive process for the body to go through and so as i said before maintenance levels of calories is a range and so by naturally striving to maintain um maintain your calorie or body composition you, there are some days where you're gonna be in a calorie surplus and some days where you'll be a deficit and some days you might even hit it bang on who knows um so within that um what we can do is and this is and this goes back to what jj was saying earlier is that you can you can basically enforce a calorie surplus and if you are going to enforce a calorie surplus do it with carbohydrates because the diet the 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 means of turning excess carbohydrates are only in a calorie surplus directly into body fat is really really difficult it's expensive whereas fat as a as an example is a really straightforward process um, of turning directly into body fat you can if you have say a 200 calorie surplus um in the day and then you and and your surplus is made up of, of fat, you can bet that, I've just done the calculations here, that you will put on 22 grams of body fat if you have a 200 calorie surplus. Now, um, 22 grams in the scheme of things is, 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 isn't anything to be too concerned about. However, it is, um, like I say, you can mitigate that by, just having a higher carb approach and particularly if you are going to accept the fact that you're going to be in some form of calorie surplus like it's why bodybuilders will be in quote their off season and they'll be kind of going for bulking um and they will have stupidly high carbohydrate levels um be, i mean i've worked with a few previously and like like i say when we've done it there's been some that have had 700 800 grams of carbohydrate but then their fat intake has been really really low really really low like 50 60 grams um which in the context is a really difficult thing to achieve so you might think great 700 grams worth of carbohydrate i mean i gave something similar to sal and he was moaning about eating tiger bread um all he did was like moan about eating tiger bread um and it's fun for one day but to do to when you limit your fat intake it, it really limits your food choices um and this is one of the considerations around fat when you ha increase your fat intake you have more versatility you have more flexibility within your diet but in terms of it is important to have um it is important like fat is an essential macronutrient we need it to stay alive protein is an essential macronutrient we need it to stay alive whereas carbohydrate isn't so we can afford to be a bit more compromising on that so th whilst we are here i would have some um in this kind of um more isolated environment and we've got a lot more control over our food and particularly like i've noticed in myself i have quite a low fat diet anyway but then um 
it's, it's dropped even more just because I'm being a lot more consistent with the food choices that I'm having. Um, and so we need to make sure now the, the, the literature says that you should have a minimum of 15% of your daily calorie intake from fat. Um, I personally think that that is too low and I think that it should be more like 22%. I'm not just plucking that out of the air. That's based off of, um, research papers of course but um minimum of of kind of 15 percent 22 um but 22 percent is something better to uh, to go through so if you have for example if you're aiming for 2000 calories um i would say that oops do my maths right um i would say that we needed to have a minimum of 48 grams of, of body fat as a minimum and it's it's something to kind of just um, achieve now the only thing is um and i put here so we know particularly more so than ever that we want to have some consideration around this muscle protein synthesis process it is important in the management of our um, retention of our muscle mass it is an important thing to do um now what happens is fat basically slows gastric emptying. It passes through, it, it, it digests really slowly, really, really slowly. And so what happens is this can dampen your muscle protein synthesis response. And so there isn't much to say about this other than I might have some consideration around limiting your fat intake in and around um, limiting your fat intake in and around your workout times more so than ever. Um, because we want to enhance this kind of process and um, your training to some extent will do that, particularly if you've got access to some kit. Um, and then um, and we can't really, because it's going to be a compromised um, stimulation, if you like, from your training, um, we, we want to kind of minimize any kind of dampening effect coming from our food intake so keeping your fat intake as as low as possible is going to be a really really positive um thing in and around your training however um i what i would say is just remind you it's not essential if we want to fundamentally manage our calorie intake um and if we want to manage our body composition just do that what we're talking about here is quote more optimal strategies but the, and optimal strategies in terms of performance but then will also maybe help just facilitate a bit of structure in and around your nutrition because it's very easy to kind of get sidetracked and, and and all the rest of it from that kind of point of view so yes these things are great yes these things can really bind us to our nutrition in a, in a time which um in a time which can be like we can help us just give us a bit more focus but then at the same time if it doesn't happen one day for whatever reason it's not the end of the world. And I will just go back to this. If you can end the day to say that you've had, you've been fairly consistent in your energy availability, then that is one of the, that's one of the, the, the main things. Tick the box, move on to the next. Um, so yeah, is there any questions? There's someone in the chat that I need to see, but I can't see it. Um, if you do, 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 how do I see the chat? I'll get used to this. Um, whoever's put something in the chat, I can't see it for some reason. It is not gonna, I might just have to stop sharing my screen for a moment. It's me, uh, mate, it's not important. Right, okay, cool. Can we ask questions at the end? Um, yes, right. Um, I mean, if anyone wants that, you can ask questions at the end for sure. I'll tell you what, I've got one, one other thing to, to go through. Um, and then um, any questions at the end, then please just, um, then please just go um, fire them through. Because one of the things is, um, one of the things that we want to have kind of consideration of is like, like say, how do we approach this time? We can, as I said at the beginning, we can physiologically um, 
and psychologically look to manage appetite. We can look to have some control over, um, we can use food as a real crutch in this time to, um, like I say, give us some real focus and, and purpose to what we're, we're kind of um, working towards, um, particularly with it being so uncertain. Um, and so just, I made these really, you can tell I made these notes really, really quickly be um, before. And so there's a number of different ways. So I just want to run you through a couple of ways in terms of how we attack this. We can first and foremost um, maintain flexibility. You might think, you know what? I actually trust myself. I um, I'm just, I want to maintain this flexibility. We want to, um, I've got no reason not to trust myself and I'm just going to play it day to day. And I'm going to be flexible in my food choices. And if that is you, then fantastic. I will only encourage that. But I would also make a note of trend in behaviors. So if you are seeing yourself become more less motivated, if you're seeing your calorie intake starting to rise, if you are seeing, um, like I say, some difficulties and your food intake not aligning itself in the way that you want it to you note it however if it's just a one-off don't overthink it if you have one day that's kind of over oh, overfeeding again don't overthink it it's not the end of the world it's the same thing about like although it's, i find it hilarious i use the football analogy i find it hilarious how liverpool aren't going to win the title but liverpool won um lost against watford they lost against Watford the other week. And does that all of a sudden make them a bad team? No. Does that all of a sudden make them not worthy enough to win um, the Premiership? No. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would, I would argue the same thing. Um, but um, so if it is just isolated in that, don't overthink it. If there is a trend in struggle, that's when it's like, right, okay, I need to get a hold of this. Um, now, one of the things in which you could like look to do is utilize your nutrition. And large of it is, large parts of it is we're in a food environment that is quite compromising. We have high food focus. We have um, everything is just food availability is just there. It's two steps away. And maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, there's this con concept of mindful eating, which maybe I'll kind of look to do. No, I'll touch upon some things now. But what we can first and foremost do is look to create some sort of structure to remove decision making within, the, within our, our diet. And that just then kind of just makes things black and white. Now, a lot of the work, the work that personally that I do is that I look to kind of put food as um, for, to try and help people to be quite fluid in their food intake. People use food as a uh, point of con creating control in their life. And I am of the opinion that we should kind of be a lot more fluid about it and we should be more versatile in our ability to manage our behaviors. But I would also argue that in a time like now, having using food as, as a, a crutch of control in our life might be a positive thing depending on the individual of course and so what we can do is as humans we like black and white we like yes no we like labor conservative there's no kind of middle ground um and like it's it's like one of why people get drawn to something like the ketogenic diet because it's just like can i eat this is it on the list yes can i eat this is it on the list? No. And there's, it's just either or. There's no black, it's just so black and white and you just follow that structure and it facilitates calorie deficit in um, a ketogenic diet, um, a ket um, ket the state of ketosis, sorry. And, um, and it, um, like I say, it might work for some. I mean, in my opinion, it's not great, but that's why people are drawn to it because it's very, very black and white do that, stick to it and it works. And so, cause it removes that idea of decision-making. It's not like, Ooh, can I have, do I fancy bread? No, you can't have bread. Um, and so all of the, it just removes these, these kind of quote trigger foods potentially. Um, and so one of the, some of the considerations that I would have here is how do we potentially remove decision-making within this time? Well, the most obvious one is creating some form of eating window. I put intermittent fasting there. Now intermittent fasting isn't, um something that's superior to anything it's just a way of maintaining calories managing your calorie intake if you reduce the window in which you eat 
you naturally reduce the opportunity that you have to overeat. And again, it, we as, as kind of emo emotionally driven beings like, um, like the idea of I'm hungry. Is it in my eating window? Yes, we'll eat. Is it in my eating window? No, then don't eat. And, and like I say, it just creates this very black and white thinking. Um, now I put here and this kind of to be honest we've done some stuff with some of the athletes that I work with and, and management of ghrelin and this comes around from from kind of two points so first and foremost ghrelin is just the hunger hormone signaling hormone it's basically it sends a signal and says I'm hungry um, and it is it is something that first and foremost can be can be trained um, in the sense of what we can do is so if i was to inter start intermittent fasting tomorrow um then what would happen is i would get hungry because i generally eat at around i don't know eight or nine and my hunger is aligned with that and so what um but what would happen is particularly particularly if you go between 10 and 21 days which it is likely that we will be in some form of of, of lockdown for minimum, then what we can start to do is play upon this, this notion of ghrelin being trained, being like a puppy dog, and, and kind of utilize it to our advantage. So if I am start to then create a strategy where I eat at similar times, then what I can do is just basically set an alarm on my phone to eat. And then has my alarm gone off? Yes eat has my alarm gone off no don't eat and it removes the decision making from the game as well as that what you will then start to do particularly if you do this consistently for 10 to 21 days your hunger signals then will start to align themselves with the time that the alarm goes off um, and thus making the ability to manage your appetite um, a lot easier in that sense and so you you kind of kill two birds with one stone and then if you tie if you tie that into um if you tie that into what we were saying about protein and having that frequency of protein then it just builds that kind of consistency with that and it's it's a kind of a, a, an alarm for that as well um and that kind of ties in with the notion of, of timing strategies and and stuff like that um, and so, yeah, it's just having, it's, 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 again, it's not essential, but these are all tools that you can have in your locker. And particularly if you aim to have some sort of flexibility, just manage your averages and that doesn't quite serve you. Or if you're worried about quote border meeting or, and all these kind of stuff, then just look to just refine your structure and, and have this idea of kind of control over it. The last one is something called taste fatigue or palate fatigue that I will kind of cover. I mean, in terms of like creating quote diet structures, there are so many, um, there are so many and it's just find, right, finding the right one for you. Um, now I'm just kind of identified the most clear and obvious ones, but there are, I mean, if you want to bounce ideas around finding one for you, you know where I am. I'll just say that. The last one is something called taste fatigue, palate fatigue. And so within this, this is a phenomenon which basically when you overload the same sensory stimulus, it becomes fatigued. So what we have is, is um, sensory patterns, neurons that run from the tongue to the brain. If we stimulate them in the same way, they become fatigued. And so, for example, it's the same way that if I asked you to do a load of push-ups, then your arms would become fatigued and you wouldn't want to do any more push-ups. Um, and so what we have here is something that we can play upon. Because if we stimulate the body in the same, um, with the same food or stimulate the senses with the same food, these sensory patterns get overused and they become fatigued. And then as a result, our appetite downregulates. Um, and the, the way, the, to be honest, the way in which I first came across this is I did when I was doing a, a nutrition internship years and years ago, um, I went and did some work at an elderly care home and they were just finding, finding that um, the, the, the residents just weren't 
we just had no appetite and they just weren't eating enough. And as a result, we're becoming, like I say, we're, we're experiencing difficulties. And so the only strategy that we did was just promote variety within our diet. It, and as a result, <coughs> excuse me, they're at coronavirus. Um, they, as a result, their appetite went up. Um, and it's this, it's this notion of there's always room for dessert. It's this notion of always room for dessert because you've gone from savory and then all of a sudden you're stimulating it with a sweet sensation. And then we're, we're somehow, even though we're feeling full, we're able to facilitate that. And in the sense of it's like Christmas Day, I mean, there's, there's, I read one paper um, that said that the average American consumes 6,000 calories on Christmas Day. And that is because the only, like, that's actually quite a difficult thing to do. Um, uh, well, I'd argue that, but um, but it is. I know Sanjay would argue that, but um, that because there is just huge sensory diff stimulation, and it differs. You go from starting the day with chocolate, then you have your Weetabix, then you have your roast dinner, and then you have some more sweet sense, something sweet, and then you have, and it's just back and forth between um, different like stimuluses. And so you can reverse engineer this process and create a structure that basically plays upon this. Um, and again, it's basically giving, so the way it, what it would look like in its application would be the remo um, having two options for breakfast, two options for lunch, two options for dinner. And in a time where you question, you the the notion of food availability is uncertain um and we don't know what um and the notion of variety within our diet probably isn't going to be something we're going to promote or be even have the facility to be able to promote this might be a consideration and if you can be stripped with this or it removes the decision making because what am i going to have for breakfast well i've either got this or this cool what am i having for lunch i've got this or this um it removes decision making and there's another means of down regulation of appetite in that sense um and so yeah is it again is it essential no but is it something that um, can help? 100%, 100%. Um, and so, yeah, and then just having, um, having these ideas to be like, okay, I would argue that we'd probably want to strive for some sort of flexibility and norm, but in the times where it might just start to go or get away from us, we just start to tighten things up, then cool. That's the way I'd go about it. Um, in terms of kind of like, content i'm just going to stop the share there um the um is there any questions is there any questions are we all good are we all good i'll just double check jay did you have a question or are you good no i'm fine cool awesome well that concludes everything and I hope you've kind of found it of, of value and if you do have any questions off the back of it then um, please just let me know one of the things that I will just say is that we're the this will be the first one this will be the third, the only solo one that I'll do where it's just me I am looking forward to Thursday where I've already got kind of people lined up and then yeah and then we'll just go from there I hope you're all well. If you're in with, if you're in for the session tomorrow, you'll see my face. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, I hope you have a fantastic evening team, one and all. And I hope you're staying safe and keeping well. Take care. See you later, everyone. See you later, guys. See you tomorrow.